So I, because I started doing this as a medical student, right? I mean, I think you can imagine how the older doctors looked at me and they were like, your kidneys are just screaming right now. And I'll be like, no, they're not. Don't, don't worry about my kidneys. They're, they're fine. My colleagues have gotten used to it. So they don't really comment it anymore. It's only if, you know, we get new doctors and or new colleagues or some of the nurses that I haven't met before. They, yeah, they see it. They comment on it. I mean, it's definitely it's, it's one of the first things people tell me when we sit and eat, uh, eat lunch is like, wow, first of all, you eat a lot. And second of all, that's a lot of meat and a lot of eggs. Yeah. And they, you know, they come with, you know, small hands like, oh, you're going to, you're going to get put in the ground, like stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, don't worry. L look at my physique and look at yours. Okay. Good morning, everybody. We've got a special guest today is Dr. Rafael Al-Najjar. Correct me if I said that wrong. Hello there. <laughs> good morning. How are you? Where, where are you located, by the way? I'm in uh, Copenhagen in Denmark, so it's actually 6 p.m. right now. Evening. Okay, very good. Awesome. Well, thank you for taking the time. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, I guess just as we get started, just kind of give us a little bit about your who you are, what you do type of thing for people that haven't heard of you before, I guess. Yeah. So I am a uh, medical doctor, and uh, in my day-to-day -day life, I work in a surgery department, abdominal surgery mostly, where we do uh, all types of hernia, stoma, stuff like that. And uh, then on the side, I do, uh, I'm like a private doctor for elite businessmen and entrepreneurs who uh, really wants to, to get more focus, be more energized, get stronger and get more done. I help them uh, doing that with, uh, you know, special training, uh, strength training, eating right, and then just in general lifestyle, uh, lifestyle advice. And, and you've, how long have you been doing that for? I've been doing that for two and a half three years approximately yeah what 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 got you i mean if you you know as a surgeon you kind of i mean i did surgery for 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 quite a long time for two decades and, yeah. and before i transitioned into more lifestyle related stuff but what what propelled you to do go that route i mean obviously you're still doing the surgery you're still doing still doing the i guess general surgery stuff the the, the gi stuff um what what made you say i want to branch out and do the lifestyle stuff as well yeah, so I actually started. Uh, I was when I was when I was younger. I played uh, professional football, or what you guys call soccer, mm -hmm. and uh, I was I was pretty good. I was playing with uh, for the youth national team, but then I got injured, and so I've always wanted to enhance my own performance. Always wanted to become the best physical version of myself. And when I started studying medicine, I had uh, some of my friends started coming to me, and they had some you know small issues. Um, and at the same time, I started looking at different diets and how diet actually helped us achieving um, both mental clear clarity and uh, and getting stronger in general. Uh, so I started focusing on on keto, and I did that for. I was a very heavy, heavy proponent of of a ketogenic diet for maybe two three years. I read it. Uh, I read about it in, uh, in Tim Ferriss's uh, one of his books. And I was amazed that they didn't teach us that in uh, medical school uh, because they, as you know, they don't really teach us anything about uh, nutrition, anything about food, uh, other than uh, what they, what they tell us in the, in the mainstream. So when I heard about keto, I was, I was amazed that you could actually do the total opposite of what they tell us to do, feel better. Um, and I did it and I instantly felt better. I started doing uh, three day fasts with only, only drinking water, uh, water, coffee, and tea. Um, and this, I, I wasn't heavy. It wasn't because I wanted to lose weight. I just wanted more clarity. Uh, I wanted to be able to focus longer when I had to do uh, some of these big assignments uh, during med school. And it really helped uh, a ton. Like for, even for my bachelor thesis, I had, uh, I was fasting for a full week uh, when I was writing it. So it was, it was just amazing to see that you had all this information out there that they didn't teach us, especially at uh, at medical school. And then I, uh, I, I don't really know how I got into carnivore after that, uh, because when with ketogenic diets, they always say don't eat too much protein. Protein is not good for you. Blah 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 is going to hurt your kidneys. All this stuff. But you need protein to build muscle, and I wanted to build more muscle because I was I was very athletic. Athletic. Uh, I was a footballer, and I could run. I could run fast, but I, I wasn't really that strong. So I wanted to build that and I needed protein. And I think that's how I actually transitioned and learned more about the carnivore diet. 
and obviously you're the biggest proponent of the carnivore diet in the world. Uh, and that's how I, uh, how I discovered you. And since then, I haven't really looked back. It's been purely carnivore since then. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I see more and more physicians that are adopting this either personally or using it in their practice, you know, for, for various issues. And the reason, you know, I'm, I'm a proponent of this is not necessarily for athletic performance, although I think you can do great with it. I think it's more, you know, we're seeing people with lots of medical conditions getting better. I don't know. Have you been able to yeah. implement it at all in your practice with some of the patients? I mean, I can imagine, you know, I mean, I don't know how much well, what, what, what you see generally, I mean, a lot of general surgeons are seeing gallbladders and, you know, bowel obstructions and you know, I'm not sure what your day-to-day -day stuff is like and how that would impact that. Yeah. So actually in, in my, in my day-to-day, -day, uh, at the hospital, I don't really, I talk about it a little bit with my patients, but it's not something that I, uh, that I put a, look, a lot of focus on because it, it actually, you know, it, it goes against the guidelines uh, that you should, uh, tell people to eat a lot of meat and eat a lot of fat. So I can't really go out and tell my patients to do that when uh, the well, the older doctors would be like, what are you talking about? We can't let you say that. So it's only something that I tell my, uh, mainly my friends. That's how I started. And people who start contacting me and, and want my uh, my advice about lifestyle. I had one guy who, uh, actually this started with, with one of my friends who, he has uh, colitis. And um, he was so bad. He was, was overstressed, drank a lot of alcohol, didn't really sleep that much. And ended up in a state where they would actually give him a colostomy, colostomy bag. And then he reached out to me and told me, like, what should I do? And I told him, I think you should do carnivore. You should actually just only eat meat, nothing else, meat and water. And uh, he, they, they, they told him actually that they would uh, do surgery on him uh, within the next week. But then he changed his diet and uh, he felt better instantly within the next two, three days. And they call off the surgery. And since then, he's only been, he's, he's felt very, very good. He avoided the, the stoma bag, which, as you know, is, uh, is, is a very, very good accomplishment. Uh, so he was, uh, he wasn't, he is very happy about that. That's one of the, one of the examples. Yeah. I mean, I see it with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease pretty commonly now. In fact, we're going to get some research going specifically on some of those issues uh, with carnivore diet, which I'm excited to, to, be kind of a part of in the background, but I don't know how many people could have avoided, you know, that, you know, cause you know, it's Crohn's disease, mm -hmm. something like 40% of the people go on to have some sort of surgery where they have some sort of bowel resection, which yeah, uh, is just, is just disastrous. And that, and that, that category of inflammatory bowel disease is increasing. We're seeing more and more people. There's several million in the U S and I don't know, Europe probably has quite a few and stuff like that. So you, you did your training in, is it in Copenhagen in, in Denmark or was that where you? It's in Copenhagen. Your, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm aware of, there's another physician there, Don, I forget her last name. She's an ER physician, I think in, maybe in Copenhagen as well. Carnivore died for Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And she was a ER physician joints dislocating every day. She literally would wake up every day with three or four dislocated joints and have to put them in to start her day. And then she'd go to the ER, do her shift. And about every other shift, something would pop out of place. And that was her life for decades. She went carnivore and she stopped having dislocations, which was quite, quite, quite amazing to me. Um, you know, as far as, you know, so you said, you know, you're kind of limited on what you can say within the healthcare system because we have a stupid healthcare system that you know, that's not the hell they're doing yeah. in a lot of cases regarding nutrition. But um, so you said you've got this alt, you know, this, this sort of, I don't know if you want to call it a side hustle or a secondary <laughs> practice, uh, where you're, where you're taking, you know, people that want to perform well, you know, and so are you integrating any, any dietary changes with those, those folks? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I had, uh, one guy come to me with, uh, with skull dermatitis and he had, uh, he'd seen a dermatologist for seven months and he'd been on, uh, isotretinine. And hadn't seen any changes in uh, in seven months. And then I put him on a carnivore diet, and for one, for one, after the first month, he saw instant changes, like the the dermatitis almost uh, disappeared. It was I was even stunned at how fast it uh, it went uh, because he, I mean, you know how um, how potent isotretinoin is, mm -hmm. and after seven months being on it and n without anything really happening. Um, it was, it was very, very good to see that, uh, his sculpt, his sculpt, um, improved a lot, uh, on a carnivore diet. So I always, I always start them on a carnivore diet and then I tell them, okay, now this is the base. You can eat meat, um, and water. And some people like to eat food as well. 
but then they can add back the stuff like the green veggies, maybe rice, maybe potatoes. But I cut out literally all processed stuff. Like I don't, I don't take people in who who are not really serious about it. I tell them you're gonna do the carnivore diet. You're only going to eat meat and drink water, coffee or tea. And then we'll take stuff back in after that mm. to see, okay, so what can you tolerate and what can't you tolerate? Yeah. I mean, so it's, it's you know, so elimination diet um, and then, and then you, you know, you reintroduce, see what's available. And it's, you, you're obviously reintroducing whole, whole actual foods, not yes. the processed garbage, which so many, so many of us yes. have sits on. What about, you know, during the, the, like, do does everybody just start cold turkey? Like, hey, t- today you know you're eating garbage, and tomorrow you're strict carnivore. Do they transition down, or how do you how do you approach it? How, how do you approach that? So I I think it's it's pretty filtered out because I only work with with uh, very serious uh, entrepreneurs or businessmen, and maybe they're at at a point in, in their life where they they can really see that they need to do something. They need to change something. And um, maybe that's why they're so motivated to just doing cold turkey and just starting from like literally just starting carnivore, carnivore. But I have like some of my friends, I tell them to to go into it easily because they're not necessarily as motivated uh, to do it. And they don't have the the same issue. They don't want to perform uh, in the same way as some of these top businessmen wants to. Um, but then obviously you have to, you know, gradually get them into the carnivore diet and then take things back after that. When, when they see results. Well, yeah, it's interesting because when we talk about, you know, a lot of people, we associate this with, you know, health issues, uh, some people, you know, physical improvements. But when we talk about business performance, and cognitive performance, how, how, how are you seeing it impact the folks you're working with? Because you said they're, they're business people. They want to perform well in their mm-hmm. in their particular vocation or their, their, their career. How is that impacting them? I mean, it's, it's, it's literally their day-to-day lives. Instead of uh, having those sugar crashes uh, during midday, they can just keep on going. Uh, they don't have the the ups and downs of their uh, blood sugar. They don't have the ups and downs of the insulin. They, they're literally very stable. And it, it just stabilizes their mood, stabilizes their energy levels, and just helps them get more stuff done. Uh, because they're not dependent on on their body. Uh, and they're not depending on, on being happy on, and motivated. They have the baseline of energy. And they just work from there what is the in denmark what is the situation as far as the, the ease or the ability to do a carnivore diet is is i, I know that it, certainly we're seeing some areas in that part of the world you know some of the scandinavian countries and then you know kind of where you are there's there's sort of a push to maybe go plant-based or something like that is it is it challenging to do this diet where you're at do you mean logistically challenging or yeah i mean is it financially feasible is it is it you know i mean because sometimes uh well i don't know the situation there for sure but i'm just kind of wondering if it might be yeah it's i mean it's definitely uh it's not cheap to eat only meat uh but i always recommend you could always eat ground beef because that's, that's just the cheapest cut to get um you don't have to eat ribeyes and uh, and fillets every single day uh, so ground beef is 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 cheaper, but it's not cheap. Mm-hmm. It's always cheaper to get processed foods. Uh, you know the the garbage that uh, that you're trying to sell. Um, so it's it's logistically possible, but obviously it's not possible for everyone to do it uh, at this moment. Especially because they don't want to do it. They're just pushing all the the vegan and the processed food so much and making it cheaper and cheaper. So it's people don't want to, because people look at calories, right? They don't really look at the the imp- impact of what those calories are uh, when they come from carbs, for example, and processed foods. So they say, okay, well, I can get a hundred calories for two bucks, or I can get a hundred calories for 10 bucks if I eat meat. And then they f- fill themselves up with, uh, with garbage. So it's, it's not hard. Obviously you can, you can get meat everywhere, but it's definitely, uh, it's definitely more expensive. Yeah. It's, it, Cause you mentioned beef and a lot of us, you know, prefer beef. I mean, that's what I prefer. If you give me, you know, I mean, yeah. nine times out of 10, probably 99 times out of a hundred, to be honest, I'll eat, I'll pick beef over anything else. Is that in, in Denmark? I mean, obviously there's, there's a lot of coastal regions there. Seafood, a big pro player is lamb, sheep, lamb, I don't know, pork. What's uh what's the, what's the prevailing sort of meat sources there? Yeah, we, we have a lot of beef, uh, and we have, um, a big tradition of eating a lot of pork as well uh, during holidays, but a, a lot of people eat pork. A lot of people eat beef um, and not fish that much. Fish is more uh, in, in Norway, up uh, up north in, uh, in Scandinavia. They eat a lot of uh, a lot of salmon, for example. 
well, we don't eat that much uh, that much fish here. We just don't have the, yeah, we just don't get the the amount of fish that, you know, it's just easy to get beef and we don't need that much lamb either. And I mean, are you getting it from, from, from next door in, in Netherlands or, I mean, cause I know they had, a, they, they're recently under pressure to, to cut back on their, their, their beef yeah. productions to meet nitrogen fertilizer, you know, issues apparently is what's going on. Is that impacting what's your access there? Is that where you get a lot of it from? No, it's it's actually okay. It's not really impacting it. Uh, beef prices went up. I think that they did the same in the U.S. Uh, a couple of months uh, back, but now they're they're back down again. Not same levels, but a bit bit down. Uh, we get most of our beef from locally here in Denmark and from Ireland, and then we get fish mainly from uh, from Norway. I see. And you know, as far as I'm um, just your personal diet, what does that look like for you? Are you eating, you know, I don't know, a kilo a day, or what? what what's that look like? Yeah. Yeah, I'm actually eating a kilo a day. I'm eating a kilo a day and because I'm I'm trying to put on some more muscle. Uh, I'm uh, I've added some some rice as well, just to to keep the hunger flowing so I can stay hungry and eat more. Um, but yeah, I eat I definitely eat one kilo a day and sometimes a kilo and a half of uh, of red meat a day. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's I'm, that's kind of where I'm at at baseline. Sometimes sometimes two kilos, sometimes more, <laughs> depending. Yeah, yeah. And because you mentioned the rice, and it's interesting because one of the you know there's a, there's a recent meta analysis on the ability to put on muscle with low carb and high carb diets, and basically the, the literature supports that you can do equally well with either. The one caveat is that carbohydrates do tend to, to stimulate the appetite more, and so it's just a matter of getting yes. enough calories in, and that's where people struggle at is they just can't eat enough before they get too full on a meat based. That's why it's been so effective at weight loss for a lot of people. But, um, you know, if you power through, you can do it, but it's, it's, like I said, it's cheaper and easier to just put in the carbohydrates if you can tolerate them. And some people do, some people don't. Exactly. And that's exactly what I do. I eat, I eat a bit of rice, uh, to just stimulate that hunger even more to get in more meat because I eat like 95, 99% meat, nothing else. Mm -hmm. So I just get some rice to stimulate that, uh, that hunger feeling. And it's, I mean, I don't know if you're a hundred percent carnivore, right? You don't eat any, any carb. Yeah. I mean, every once in a while, like, but not, not, you know, basically every day is they say steak, sometimes eggs right now. I'm eating a lot of eggs, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, like on a birthday party, I'll have something like a piece of cake every once in a while, but yeah, not, you know, I'm not regularly including fruit or honey or rice or anything like that. That's, that's Mm. pretty much never makes it in my diet. Yeah. Yes, I, I eat uh, a kilo of meat and then I eat a lot of eggs. When I'm home, I tend to eat 10 eggs a day because it's just easier to, to get that in for lunch, for example. Uh, when I'm at the hospital, I, um, I, don't, I don't take food with me. We have a, a buffet and it's okay. So I tend to eat whatever meat they have at the buffet at the hospital and then six or seven uh, cooked eggs as well. Uh, you know, I don't know how it was. I know when I would go to the hospital cafeteria and sit down and I'd eat whatever, you know, <laughs> a bunch of eggs and bacon and hamburger patty. People would look at me and go, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. Baker? Are you getting some of that? Are you getting people coming up to you saying, looking at you, what, what what's going on, man? Don't you know any better? You know, that's all that saturated fat's going to kill you. Are you seeing that? Uh, every single day, Sean, every single day. And uh, so, I, because I started doing this as a medical student, right? And uh, I mean, I think you can imagine how how the older doctors looked at me, and they were like, "Wow, you're getting your kidneys are just screaming right now." And I'll be like, "Yeah, <laughs> no, they're not. Don't don't worry about my kidneys. They're they're fine." And um, even to this day, like every single day, now my um, my colleagues have gotten used to it, so they don't really comment it anymore. It's only if you know we get new doctors and or new colleagues or some of the nurses that I haven't met before, they uh, they see it, they comment on it, but it's not. I mean, it's definitely it's one of the first things people tell me when we sit and eat uh, eat lunch is like, wow, first of all, you eat a lot. And second of all, that's a lot of meat and a lot of eggs. So, yeah. And, they, you know, they come with, you know, small hands like, oh, you're going to you're going to get put a grand like stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, don't worry. Look at my physique and look at yours. Yeah, it's always a nice counter to have that to, to you know, when you have somebody that's clearly obese eating whatever salad and, you know, donuts or something like that. <laughs> Um, yeah. you mentioned kidneys, um, in just, just for the people that may be listening on the, why are you not concerned about protein and kidney damage? You know, there's a lot of us, you know, a lot, a lot of physicians are even under the, the perception that, uh, well, kidneys that are failing spill protein and therefore protein is bad. It puts too much stress on the kidneys. What are your thoughts on that? 
to be honest, I don't, I, I don't have uh, much experience with, um, with patients with, um, you know, kidney damage. So I, I don't really want to talk about that much, but if you have healthy kidneys, there is no issue at all eating only meat, no issue at all. Uh, recent studies have shown that, that, uh, the kidneys are, are not being damaged by eating only meat. Um, so, but maybe you can, you can clarify that. How, uh, how do you see that? Well, I mean, you're correct. I mean, I'm, I'm specifically protein, cause that's a concern and protein has not been shown to damage kidneys. Stu Phillips's meta-analysis in 2018 showed that quite clearly. And David Unwin, who practices in the UK has actually done, uh, uh, interventions using higher protein, low carbohydrate diets. So a lot of meat. Uh, in his diabetic patients that did have kidney disease, and he actually saw a reversal. Their GFR got better. Mm. So we're actually seeing improvement, not only not is it not harming, but it's actually improving uh, people with you know chronic kidney disease. And so uh, I'm not concerned about it at all. The one thing I will mm. say is that you know we often will see a bump in, you know we might see a higher level of creatinine, which is you know used to calculate yeah. the GFR. Unfortunately, yeah. you know there's pro- there's a number of problems with that particular calculation. One, it doesn't take into account big people. You know, because, you know, assume your your body surface area is 1.73 meters, I think. And I'm like yeah. one, one and a half times that. So it always sort of underestimates it. But so we use something called cystatin C, which is independent of protein consumption, independent of muscle mass, independent of protein turnover. So like if you have somebody who's big, muscular, working out hard and eating a high protein diet, they're always going to have a high creatinine. And, you know, it's always the little old ladies yeah. that don't have any little muscle mass. And you see these really low creatinines and so um you know whereas somebody that has kidney disease may show creatinine going up but that's not the same as somebody who has a lot of muscle or is eating a lot of protein so you get a cystatin c yeah. which kind of kind of allows you to do that and that's another way to estimate the gfr we because we never directly measure it you know you to directly measure it you have to 24-hour urines and some other things yeah exactly will be used which almost no one ever no one ever does outside of your outside of uh, nephrology um, as far as, so let's talk about another, the other sort of thing. And I know this is kind of a dead horse for a lot of people here, you know, saturated fat, dietary cholesterol, serum cholesterol. Aren't you worried about that heart disease, <laughs> oh, you know, on and on and on. Not at all. Not at all. Saturated fats are, do not cause heart disease. Um, and I know you know this already, but they don't, uh, there is no cor- correlation between that. It's definitely the, um, the insulin resistance and people with metabolic syndrome, they're more likely kids to get heart disease than uh, people who eat a lot of saturated fat or have a lot of cholesterol in their bloods. It, consuming cholesterol will not raise your um, serum cholesterol levels. Th- that's not just not how it works, right? So I am a big proponent of eating a lot of saturated fat uh, and that's just meat, right? So uh, I don't know. I don't have an issue with that at all. When they tell me that, I'm like, okay, just look at the, you, you can look at the LDL triglyceride ratio instead or the insulin resistance instead of, of looking at the cholesterol, or you can use the, uh, what's it called? The calcium artery score, mm-hmm. the CAC. Mm-hmm. Um, that is a way better predictor of, um, of heart disease and like, yeah, cardiovascular disease in general. Yeah. I mean, it depends on what studies you look at. I know the women's health study analysis show that, uh, you know, diabetes and metabolic syndrome were, were way up there as far as being correlated with cardiovascular disease, whereas ApoB or LDL was sort of a minor player. It was still a risk factor, but it was very low. And then, um, you know, I think they even showed triglycerides were a better predictor of heart disease in that particular cohort. So it is uh, interesting. There was a, just a recent analysis looking at red meat. Uh, University of Washington, you know, basically just said there's no real evidence that shows red meat is – causing any diseases, cancer, heart disease, mm-hmm. diabetes, any of that. It's all just a bunch of really, really shoddy science, which is kind of sad that we've been kind of led down this path of <clears throat> self-destructive behavior for, for populations um, unnecessarily because of just this really poor, poor research. Um, do you find that, uh, you know, uh, as far as your own personal ability to perform to function to be stronger has been easier Com- compare let's compare ketogenic diet to carnivore diet how has that been because a lot of people say well, i'll just do keto it's the same or close enough or carnivore is really just keto with another name um what are your thoughts on the differences between the two so, i mean if, if you do a, a ketogenic diet you 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 can't eat a lot of protein 
And if you can't eat a lot of protein, you're, you're not building muscle. You, you can build a, there was this study in, uh, back from October that showed that you had to eat one and a half grams of, uh, of protein every single day per, per uh, kilo of body weight to have the optimal amount of, of protein to build muscle. And they show that even if you don't eat a lot of protein, you will still build muscle, but you're just not, it's just not optimal. So if you're ketogenic, which is very, very good for mental clarity, uh, Obviously, if you only get your uh, your fat from uh, from whole foods, you will get a lot of mental clarity. Or you'll get a lot of energy, but it's just and and maybe you can perform physically, but you're not going to get stronger. You're not going to build muscle uh, as well as if you eat uh, a carnivore diet, because then there you get all the protein. You're not getting enough protein if you only eat uh, a ketogenic diet. So ketogenic diets are are good as long as they they only eat whole foods and they don't use all the you know, the sweeteners and, you know, bake all those cookies with almond, almond flour and, you know, stuff like that. Like if they eat, if people eat whole foods on a ketogenic diet, it's okay. It's good. But a carnivore diet will give you the exact same benefits and will give you all the proteins to build the muscle that you need to, to grow stronger. Do you feel, I mean, cause a lot of people will say, well, muscle's not important for health. I mean, you don't need to be strong. I mean, there's, there's no benefit to that. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm playing devil's advocate here and I don't agree with that, but are, do you feel that lean mass has a, has a benefit? Why, why would, why would we want to, why would we want to be, have more muscle? I mean, it seems like obvious, but mm -hmm. why, why, why medically would we want to do that? Yeah. So uh, when we have more muscle, I mean, if, when you're, when you're um, below 50 years of age, uh, you're not really going to see much of a difference if you ha have a lot of muscle or not. But when you get older, you start losing your muscle mass. And th that is where you, you start having these issue issues with uh, with balance. And like when you fall and you break a leg or break a hip, that's where the issue arises. The issue is not when you're 35 and you don't have a lot of muscle. The issue is when you're 55 or 65 and you start uh, losing balance because your muscles are just too weak to, too weak to, um, to make you stand up. Um, and the muscles will also, like if you're 35, for example, will give you a lot of, a lot of energy, will help you with, um, with focus and, um, and keep your metabol metabolism going on. So muscle is, is important. It's, I would say it's important when you're 35, but m way more important when you're 65, because it will help you live longer and stop falling. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, I'm, I'm soon to turn 56 and I'm actually putting on muscle right now. And I'm, you know, I've, I've changed a little training around, got some different stuff at the home and I'm actually seeing muscle growth, which is kind of nice just to see at that age. And mm. it's interesting that, you know, particularly starting young and building that base in your early 20 or your twenties and thirties steads you pretty well long term. Um, also, we know that lean mass in particular is associated with longevity. Uh, it's, it's one of the, one of the better predictors for longevity is how much functional lean mass you have on yourself. And then it also reduces heart disease, diabetes, dementia, you know, hypertension, cancer risk, all those things are, are there. So it's kind of nice, mm. nice to see that. Um, as far as, uh, you know, you're not consuming any, you know, you said occasionally a little bit of rice for appetite, but you're not consuming any significant amount of carbohydrate. Are you still able, to, I mean, uh, depending on how much time you have, I know as, as a surgeon, your time is often very challenged and limited. Are you still able to do, um, you know, cardiovascular stuff? I mean, are you out running around on the, on the, on the uh, football, you know, field or anything or doing anything that's cardiovascularly challenging? Yeah. So I, I actually box, uh, I have, I've stopped playing football because of an injury. So I, uh, I actually box and that's what I do for, uh, for cardiovascular fitness. Um, and I do. I do very, very light running, uh, more jogging. Uh, so that's not that cardiovascular. But in my training program, I, I incorporate what I call a, or what, what, um, what is called a metabolic finisher. So that's just a very short spurt of, uh, of cardio. I like to do uh, jumping ropes. So I do uh, three times uh, one minute of jumping ropes, uh, very high intensity. And then I do boxing. So that's that's the cardiovascular stuff I do mostly. Yeah, boxing is, I, I did that when I was in college. I boxed for a while. And that, that's definitely uh, taxing for sure, you know, particularly yeah. for sparring because then you're worried about getting hit in the head and stuff like that. Yeah. That's, that, that does that for you. Um, as far as what about electrolytes? This is something that uh, some people will have questions about, concerns about. Are you supplementing electrolytes? Are you using salt, no salt? It's You know, some people don't use any salt on a carnivore diet, which I... I find interesting. What are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I actually don't have an issue with salt. I uh, I consume way more salt than the average person, I would say. Uh, I salt uh, all of my meat when I eat it, and um, I don't use it sparingly. I don't have an issue with uh, with salt. I don't I don't believe that salt retention is is really an issue. Uh, that's not what causes hypertension. That's what they tell you, right? You can't eat salt because then you get hypertension, your kidneys, all this stuff. So I don't have an issue with that. You actually need salt, especially when you uh, when you train and when you sweat a lot. You need salt. You can't just drink water or, or coffee or tea. Yeah, I mean, you, won't, you, you once you dilute the lactic sodium to a certain level, your body's just gonna you're gonna urinate out the extra fluid. Um, and that's one of the yeah. things, you know. I you know I don't know because most of us get salt through processed food. I mean, because all the processed food has lots and lots of salt salt in there. No. And so I think the the relationship between salt and negative health outcomes are probably just a marker for how much processed food you're eating because you know you're you're adding salt to your food, but there's no. I mean, meat has a little bit of sodium there, but it's not you know it's not like eating a bag a bag of pretzels or even bread or any other things which are inherently made with mm. tremendous amounts of salt. Um, as far as, uh, you know, you mentioned protein and we talked about ketogenic diet, how much, do you have any idea what the, how much protein, how much fat you're getting on general by, by caloric percentage? Do you have, you know, how much, like how much percentage of your diet is protein by, by calorie, would you say? Uh, I would say around, <sighs> depends on the day, but I would say around 45 to 60%. Uh, is uh, is protein? Wow, that's quite, and then the rest is uh, is fat. Yeah, that's that's quite a high protein. Yeah, I was going to say. Um, and does that that come in the form of you know? So so, and again, I don't know. What the, in in the United States, like if I get a, if I get a choice or even a prime ribeye, I'm probably looking at thirty, maybe forty percent protein. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. Um, and then the rest is going to be fat. So if you're eating, you, so to get that higher protein, you're eating some more leaner cuts. And is that is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I eat a lot of lean ground beef as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to eat ribeyes, but I I need time to to eat ribeyes, and you know I don't really have that much time to yeah. to to really do that. But I enjoy eating more ribeyes. And the thing is, when I when I want to lean out, I eat more protein. Mm -hmm. And when I want to put on weight, which has, which is what I want to do right now. I eat less protein and more, a bit more carbs. Yeah. Uh, fat is always, yeah, constant, I would say more okay. or less. How does it, how does it impa impact your personal per per performance as a surgeon, for instance, you know, like, I, I don't know how, I mean, I know like I, you know, when I was operating, I liked to be everything done within an hour. I didn't like to spend, you know, three, four hours in the operating. I was in residency where I'd sit there scrubbed into assisting in some 16 hour hip revision, you know, you just hated being there that long. Um, and cause you know, it's, yeah. you get hungry, you get tired, you get bored, you're, you know, it's just, you know, holding retractors for God knows how long. Yeah. How's your performance in the operating room? Um, now it's, it's, um, I would say I've, I've only been in the operating room since I really was a kid, eating ketogenic and carnivore. So I haven't really tried it eating, uh, you know, just a standard diet. But I can, um, I mean, I, I I just came from a night shift earlier today and, you know, you don't really sleep that well. So what I do is I try to eat as early as possible and obviously eat a lot of uh, uh, whole foods, a lot of meat, a bit of rice. So my energy levels are constant, are, are like stable and uh, don't go up and down. I don't feel the need for, for like a break. Uh, and as you know, with, with GI surgeries, we have to stand there for four or five, six hours sometimes, uh, finding the issue, solving the issue. And it's, it's not an issue. You know, you get thirsty a bit, but I never get tired. I never get, I never feel like that I can't do this. Um, I used to do, when I did int intermittent fasting, I would actually eat after my shift was done at 3, 4 p.m. So I wouldn't eat from between uh, dinner the, the day before until 3, 3, 4 p.m. till my shift was done the, the day afterwards. So it's not an issue at all. I I have very stable energy levels. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because, you know, a lot of people, you know, you see, and we've, a lot of us have experienced eating carbohydrates, you know, you'll eat a meal and then you'll get real sleepy afterwards. And you can imagine, you know, you've got a surgeon who maybe he's got a big old bell and he's just, he went to lunch and he had a bunch of... You know, he had a bunch of, you know, whatever. He had some dessert cake for dessert. Yeah. And now he's operating yeah. on you in about an hour into the surgery. He's starting to get like, well, I'm a little sleepy in here. Yeah. It's not, not a good situation. <laughs> you know, you think about that. But, I mean, just kind of like, hey, what did you have for lunch, dude? <laughs> You're going to fall asleep <laughs> during the surgery on me? Uh, so, it's, it's you know, yeah. it is. I mean, you could probably look at performance metrics on surgeons based on different diets and, you know, outcomes. Because, I mean, you know, 
I mean, we all make mistakes and we all, you know, we're all subject to the same things everybody else are. Um, do you find that, uh, you know, as far as, uh, you know, I know in the situation in the United States where, you know, we've got the USDA and they're compromised by all the conflicts of interest, is, 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 is Denmark basically just following the U.S. guideline, you know, lockstep? Are they just pretty much whatever the U.S. does, we're going to do nutrition and health Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we, we are. I would say we, we're probably uh, a couple of years behind, but we're definitely on, on the same line. We also have the, the same food pyramid. Uh, we follow the European guidelines, which are created by the same companies that create the, the U.S. guidelines. Yeah. So, yeah, we're just a couple of years behind. I noticed that you said the same companies, which is kind of interesting because we're supposed to have these independent, you know, objective yeah. organizations, USDA, FDA, yeah. whatever. And it's really, really is. It's these companies that are creating these guidelines and in order yeah. to sell their own particular products and stuff like that. What is the traditional diet of the people of Denmark? I mean, if we had to go back, you know, a hundred years, you know, some people are more seafood eaters. What, what, what does it yeah. look like? A lot of potatoes, a lot of potatoes and some meat mm. and then some gravy. That's like a very traditional Danish uh, Danish food. So yeah, I would say calories would be. Uh, they recommend sixty to six to seventy percent uh, of calorie intake should be from from carbs. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, Danish people do eat that. They eat a lot of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of potatoes. Yeah, I, I often wonder. You know, the, these recommendations, and this is kind of similar. U.S. U.S. guidelines are somewhere in that 60% range from carbohydrates, and it's just because they're cheap to produce. You know, it's putting less stress yeah. on the food system. And they're like, well, we'll, well we're going to just give you kind of like, you know, it's kind of the overall population. Eh, we can't afford everybody to eat well. Let's just give them the, the basics so they don't starve. And that's kind of yeah. what we're – I think that's what we're operating on. How is obesity there relative – like in the United States, our, our current obesity rates are something at 42% for COVID pandemic. It's probably closer to – I'm guessing probably 45% right now and soon will be 50%, probably by 2030, we'll be at 50, 50% obesity rate. What are we looking at in, Cope, in in Denmark? So I don't have the exact numbers, but I think we were around 15 to 20%. Okay. So about half. Uh, maybe 25%. About half what yeah. we are, which is, which is, you know, cause I was in, I was in, I was in the UK a couple months ago or it was, yeah, August and I was just, you know, kind of like, well, there's not as many obese people here, you know, as compared to where I, when I go home, which is, which is yeah. it's good, but I mean, they're catching up. That's the problem. They're starting to catch Definitely. up. Definitely. I mean, if you look at Eastern Europe, for example, there is way, way less obese people. Um, I was in Poland a couple of months ago and you never see obese young people. Like it's almost impossible to see obese young people in Eastern Europe. They just, it's just not socially acceptable to be obese when you're 25 or 35. So. Yeah, it's, it, shouldn't be at any age to be honest but i mean it's it's it yeah. is kind of a shame when i go out and i see you know men young men in their 20s and they're already obese they, they already look like they've mm. got metabolic disease and it's you know they're not they're, they're not setting themselves up for a long happy life for sure um what is you know as far as you know your your uh sort of surgical practice are you seeing uh you know, I mean, are you seeing younger and younger patients with problems or what, what's it? I mean, obviously you haven't been in long enough to say what it was like 20 years ago, but I mean, what is a, what is it? What does a typical not a call look like for you? What do you see? Are you seeing trauma? Are you seeing bowel, bowel perforations and bowel obstructions? What's, what's going on there? We see a lot of, uh, gallbladders, uh, cholecystitis, yeah. uh, a lot of that. Yeah. Um, and I would say that's that's what we mainly see. Why do why, why do you think that is? I mean, when I when I went to medical school, I remember we you it was a four F. It was fat, female, fertile, and forty was the mnemonic we used yeah. to we used to use to learn about you know cholecystitis. And we see that you know I mean, and and what's causing you know what do you think is causing all this gallbladder issues? I mean, we, yeah, I mean, that's an organ we have. I mean, it's there for a reason, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely. Um, some sort of insulin resistance that's uh, that's causing the issue. I think that is the the main uh, the main driver of of cholecystitis. So, so I mean, who is like your, your typical patient that you see roll into the OR that needs has a hot gallbladder needs to come out? Who, what do they look like? What is what's going on? Are they typically metabolically metabolic syndrome? Yeah, yeah, they are. Like they they definitely have uh, hypertension. They usually have diabetes, and they're usually. I would say between 40 and 50 years old when they when they have the issue for the first time. We're getting some younger patients actually, like uh, mid 20s, with uh, with uh, stones in the gallbladder that's, that's giving them issues. 
So we're definitely getting younger, younger patients, but I would say the main patients are between 35 to 50. And, and what, those are the ones that we remove. And what percentage of those patients are on a carnivore diet? <laughs> Definitely zero percent. Yeah, interesting. It's kind of, you know, I'd be, it'd be interesting to see. You know, I mean, I, you know, I suspect you know, like some people will posit that uh, because we're on these low fat diets, and you know, the gallbladder's job is to you know, you know, con contract and you know, squirt bile into the into the duodenum. Um, and we're not we're not stimulating with 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 these low fat diets, and so the gall the, the bile just sits there and forms a sludge, and eventually you know the mm. we get the we get the you know the crystallization and the stones forming. And so that's a that's an interesting thought that why you know if you look at what is the function of the gallbladder, it's literally to squeeze bile in so we can uh, so we can uh, you know uh, break down fat you know emulsify yeah. fat. So interesting. Yeah, it's interesting actually. Now, as far as your you said you've got these entrepreneurs and businessmen, you know, you mentioned, you know, as far as diet, obviously you said you start them on a carnivore diet. What, what other type of things are, are you working on with them? Strength training or what, what's, what's going on there? So it's, uh, I usually have a couple of pillars where food is one of them. Training is, is a second one. Then we have sleep, which is also very, very important stress management and then water intake. So that's usually how I, uh, how I categorize the different stuff that I work with them on. Um, and food is one of the biggest ones training as well. And then sleep, um, because stress management can be different stuff. People like to be, you know, some people are religious and that's how they manage their stress. Um, I, I advocate both a, I would say a, a relaxed stress management way and a physical way of stress management with, uh, with training, physical training, like going out and like literally doing boxing, boxing on a bag. That's a very good way of managing stress. Uh, meditation is another good way of, of managing stress as well. It's just two different it's polar opposites, but they do the same things. And sometimes you need one, sometimes you need the other one. That's basically what uh, what I work with. So, and I focus a lot on sleep as well because people are just sleep deprived uh, mostly. Yeah, I was just I was just remembering the name of the the person that was in 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 uh, Copenhagen, Don Layton. Uh, she's a she's an ER physician over there, and she's. On carnivore, so you have another carnivore MD in that area. So that, that you know, if you <laughs> if you're looking for some some uh, uh, you know sort of somebody that that supports you in the same way, are you have you been able to like you, you said all the people that sort of watch you and ask you questions have any of them converted over or like started trying that you know in the hospital for my patients in the hospital it's it, I don't think any have really uh, I had a, a discussion with. Um, with one of my older colleagues the the other day, actually, because he had he has a cardiovascular disease, and he's going to this rehabilitation center where they're uh, teaching them what to eat and how to train and all this stuff. And I gently, you know, started talking to him about it, uh, about how he should maybe not follow the those guidelines, but maybe actually eat more saturated fats uh, and eat more meat. And he was very interested, so I sent him over a couple of of articles uh, two days ago. And, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens from there, but he was, he was very open, uh, open to it. And, um, but in terms of patients, I don't, I haven't really worked on, um, converting people, uh, people like that, because it's not really a, you know, I have to be honest and say, it's not really a risk that I want to take going against the, the guidelines. Um, when I, when I work at the hospital and, you know, in public uh public health yeah i was just looking up her the hospital she's at is called hellbro clinic i don't know if you know where that is i don't know <laughs> hellbro somewhere in yeah. somewhere in Copenhagen, <laughs> okay. if you're familiar with that place um so when you get a when you get a diabetic or uh you know an insulin resistant patient you know you know and the hospital diet is i mean i don't know are you ever like disappointed in the diet that they're given post-op or <laughs> pre-op I mean, would you be happy eating pancakes and jam every single day? Yeah, yeah. Is that what they're getting over there? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. They're definitely getting. That's that's what they're getting. And when they get these, um, they give them some of these protein shakes, protein drinks, which are filled with sugar. So it's more of a, um, you know, I would say it's more of a candy bar with added protein than it's really a, a protein drink. So they eat a lot. They get a lot of carbs, a lot of bread, a lot of mashed potatoes, a lot of sugar. That's that's mainly what the what they eat. and but as you know that's not good for for anything for uh, healing wounds for anything 
Um, it doesn't really give them the energy to to heal, whether inside or outside their bodies. So it's just it just it is what it is, right? Yeah, it is kind of interesting that that you see that, and there's probably an insulin sliding scale attached to that. You know, very very frequently that you, you know you're just like, you know, I, I remember when I used to write those, I didn't really, I, I was like, okay. And I wasn't comfortable with it as a, as an orthopedic guy. I just really wasn't managing diabetes, and you know, I was just okay. Here's a standard insulin sliding scale, and it was just like yeah. you know, I didn't think about it because like, this is what you do. Um, as far as uh, you know, wound healing that's an important topic because obviously, as a surgeon, you want your wounds to heal. I mean, we don't want mm. dehiscences and infections, and it's, it's a nightmare. You know, we just we're trying to avoid that stuff. And we know that nutrition plays a role in wound healing. Is that something that the hospital or, or you yourself, I mean, obviously, if you're doing an emergency, you don't have time to to dial this stuff in. But if you got somebody who's coming in for an elective procedure, I mean, is there, is there something yeah. we can do to improve our, our wound healing capability? We we, uh, we mainly talk with, with patients who are vegan, vegan or vegetarian, mm -hmm. and tell them that it's actually a very bad idea to to be vegan or vegetarian with, uh, in terms of wound healing, just in terms of everything, but especially with, with wound healing. And those are the only ones that we really try to, uh, try to convert over to, to start eating meat or at least supplementing it, you know, supplementing the stuff won't really help you because they, they won't do it diligently. And, um, I just don't believe in, in supplementing, uh, when, when you're vegan, because you just won't do it right. Uh, it just takes too much time and it's, it's very, uh, it's very complicated and most people just don't do it right. So I always advocate my, uh, my vegan patients not to be vegan at all. Um, I'm not telling them to eat a kilo of meat every single day, but I tell them that it's a very bad idea and it's not going to help them with, uh, with wound healing at all. Yeah. I'll just, I'm just going to share my screen real quick. Cause it's, it's, it's sort of topical here, but this is a, I don't know if you guys can see this study here. It was, uh, you know, this was a study yeah. came out in 2021. It was out of Italy. There was four studies that were done around vegan diets negatively impacting surgical wound healing. They basically showed that the vegans did, did really bad. They had a lot of scar, uh, you know, dehiscence. They had, uh, you know, widening of the wounds. And so they just don't heal as well. And so it's, it's, I think it's a, that is a good observation. And I'm, I'm sure many of them, particularly the ethical ones, that they're like, I'm not going to change my diet. Uh, regardless, I've seen some studies on, you know, increasing protein, you know, by about, you know, say, uh, you know, basically increasing protein consumption about 15%, you know, period, you know, for about a month in that perioperative period. Uh, and again, depending on what your baseline diet is, obviously your diet, my diet, we got plenty of protein. We're not going to have an issue with healing. And I've heard, mm -hmm. you know, so severally, at least anecdotally, people just healing really, really well on this diet, which, which makes sense to me. You've given yourself the uh, you know, what you're healing animal tissue, you know, animal cells, animal tissue. What do you need to heal? Yeah. It? Well, you need animal cells, whatever makes it. So kind of makes sense yeah. to me in that regard. Um, what, what, have you had any difficulties with the diet? I mean, any negatives to it? Some people, you know, cause I, just to be fair, some people will say, well, there's all these potential negative things or any negative things for you so far. I think, uh, maybe not negative, but, but most people, um, when they start being carnivores, they get they get a lot of diarrhea in the first two weeks, mm -hmm. and they don't really uh, expect that. Uh, no one really talks about that uh, that much. Um, but I haven't really felt any. I haven't had any issues more than logistically. Like logistically, it's sometimes it's just hard when you're at the hospital, for example, and you haven't brought your own food or they don't have the right food. Um, but any other thing than than logistically? No, I haven't had any issues at all. Yeah, yeah. That's and you know, like I said, I, for most people outside of you know some you know early transition stuff, generally they do pretty well, even long term. I mean, the, the study from Harvard University showed that pretty low rates of side effects. You know, there was a, there was a few. I mean, some people had some digestive constipation, diarrhea, but it's pretty low rate, and generally it was you know most people did well with that. So that can, that kind of shows. Uh, with that, yeah, and it makes sense, right? It's evolutionary. It just makes sense that we ate meat, and that's how we how we evolved. Uh, instead of eating bananas and you know just veggies. Well, I mean, the, the monkeys are still eating the bananas, and their brain hadn't gotten any bigger. I mean, they've been eating plenty of bananas for a long time. So if that was if that was what was required to grow our brains, why why are they still sitting there with a three hundred cc brain? Um, so yeah, something had to have changed. And some people say it's fire and just accessing and you're cooking up starch and, and this type of stuff, which. I think the majority of the, the evolutionary literature doesn't sort of comport with that. Most of it's clear that we 
found and killed a lot of big old mammoths. And yes, yeah, interesting, you know, in, in that part of the world where you're at, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's cold most of the year or relatively cold. There's not tropical fruits everywhere. I mean, you might get some berries and things like that, but I mean, and you know what? I was in Iceland a few years back giving a lecture and the people in Iceland totally got the carnivore diet. Cause they're like, look, there's not a lot of options up here on this frozen rock. You know, <laughs> you know, you get some seafood, you can, whatever animals grow, but there's not, there's not a lot of vegetation that we have options for. Mm -hmm. Um, and they used to, because, you know, as you know, Iceland used to be part of Denmark. Denmark, I know there's still a relationship there. I think with Denmark yeah, colonized, is, yeah. colonized Iceland and kidnapped some Irish monks or something. I don't know what the story is. Something like that. <laughs> something like that. Something like that. They used to send out, they would export, I think, some grain out there to feed their animals. Maybe it was barley or some kind of grain, I think. So um, as far as, uh, you know, because we're, we're unfortunately running out of time here. Are you doing anything on social media where people want to find you? Maybe somebody, in, are you, is, is, are all your clients for this, uh, 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 executive type stuff, the entrepreneurial, is it all local to Denmark? Or are you seeing people, uh, online internationally? I actually mostly see people online internationally. Okay. Uh, I have, uh, one guy from Denmark. And that's, you know, through a, through a business network. But I mostly have international uh, patients and clients. The, and I, I'm on IG. I'm on Twitter. Uh, I just started using TikTok. Mm -hmm. yeah. I haven't really, you know, <laughs> I need to become better at that. But uh, yeah. What, and what are your, if somebody wanted to find you on, on those sites, where do you, what do you list it? I'll, I'll go find you on Instagram and give you a follow there if I can find it. What do you, what's your handle there? Yeah, my handle is, uh, is Raphael and the jar. Uh, R A P H A E L A L N A J A A R. So it's literally just my name with without the dash and just in one. And uh, you can find me in one of your followers as well. So Raphael and then Najar, um, and then just Najar. No, Al Najar. Raphael Al Najar. L Najar. So you want yeah. to find you. M -A -N -A. That's my name on on all platforms on Twitter, IG, and TikTok. Cool. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, thank you for taking the time out for doing this. I know it's your time is pretty precious when, when you're, when you're doing what you do. Uh, thanks for being courageous for to try this out and, and confirm that, you know, yet another physician is figuring this stuff out. Cause we need more and more because it's, you know, like I said, hopefully we can make a difference and change the standard of practice to where we can say, look, you know, let's give people high quality nutrition. So not so many damn diseases we're treating because we're kind of chasing our tail otherwise. Okay. Thanks a bunch, yeah, man. Good luck to you. And uh, if I ever get over to, to Denmark, I'll have to look you up. You're more than welcome. Thanks. All right, guys. Rest of you guys. Right. We'll see everybody back tomorrow. Okay. Take care, guys. Bye-bye now.